another podcast here from the Michigan Institute of Athletics in Brighton, Michigan. It's going to be an awesome podcast today. I'm joined by two gentlemen that I've known for multiple years with an incredible story that are launching a project coming up in the near future that we want to make uh, the public aware of it and really just hype up how great of a story it is. So before we get into it, I want to make sure I shout out VetLife. VetLife is a 501c3 nonprofit. It's a company of veterans for veterans. Pretty much everybody knows someone that's gone overseas, fought for the country, you know, fought for our rights, fought for our freedom. And when they came back, it's a difficult prospect to venture back into normal society. You lose your brotherhood. You lose a lot of things that are a part of your structure. So VetLife is there to help ease that transition. The easiest way to reach out to VetLife is simply on Instagram or Facebook, or you can go to their website at vetlifetoday.org. Uh, or feel free to shoot me a message or shoot Josh Paris a message. We're here together. We want to help the community. We want to help people get back on their feet. So without further ado, the two guests joining me today are Taylor Dewar and Mike Ramsdell. Uh, Mike is a documentary filmmaker that's been capturing Taylor's incredible story. And Taylor Dewar is a gentleman that was uh, born here in Detroit. And uh, you know what? I don't, I don't want to tell a story in advance. Let's do, let's do it this way. Taylor, for the people that don't know you, let's go a little bit about your background story, You know where you grew up. And uh, let's take us to the point of how you met Ramsdell and I. Okay. Um What's up, everybody? Um, so I grew up in Royal Oak, um, youngest of three boys. My parents, you know, I, I had a good life growing up. Um, you know, we grew up middle class, working class. My parents uh, never split. They're still together together to this day. Um, so, like, you know, I say that in advance because a lot of people who have, like, addiction problems, you, it could be traced back to their home life. So... Um, you know, I didn't really, I never had any, any issues of that nature. Um, I grew up, I started, I, I was just always su- super curious growing up. Um, you know, like, uh, I always wanted to do bad things, um, or be, you know, be, be naughty or, you know, just get into it. You know, I, I take a lot of pride in being part of the last non-tech generation, if you would, um, meaning like no cell phones or tablets. I mean, there were cell phones, but like, you know, not, not not anywhere near today you know um the only time i was ever really stuck in front of a screen for a long time and not playing outside was when i was like playing grand theft auto or something like that so i grew up playing outside um you know f- you know uh, street hockey you know getting into stuff like that and then getting into as much trouble as i could um you know i always i <laughs> i had always had dogs growing up so like if we didn't like a neighbor you know me and my friends you know, if you, like, yelled at us, we were doing something in the street, me and my friends would go ba- back later to their house that night and throw dog poop on their car, that kind of stuff. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, I grew up, like, first it started with smoking cigarettes, um, which, unfortunately, I still do occasionally to this day. Um, but, like, when I was nine years old, we were walking down the street, and we saw an empty pack of Newports on the ground, me and my friends, um, I think the oldest one of us was 10, and we were nine, me and my, uh, a couple of my other best friends growing up. And uh, we opened the pack and there was a dime bag of weed. So we called, we all got super excited, you know, and we called my, uh, one of my brother's friends to, uh, you know, help have, us, have him help us come smoke it. And then in turn, we would give him the rest. So that was my first experience with anything really mind-altering. Um, and a lot of people say they don't get high the first time they smoke, but I got really high. I got so <laughs> high that I hallucinated um, Jeff Gordon's flaming car flying down my street. And uh, I think I stayed high for about 12 hours. So I got a little scared. Um, I remember I told my mom I didn't want to show her my eyes because I – was playing with a lighter and I singed my eyebrows off. Um, So, and of course she could, she wouldn't have expected anything. I was a cute little nine year old kid and I could always talk my way out of trouble, you know? So um, that was my first experience with weed. And then that kind of just grew. And by the time I was in uh, middle school, I was a everyday smoker, you know, with weed and cigarettes. And, um, you know, I was stealing car parts off of cars, just, you know, doing doing crazy shit all the time. I'm sorry, can I swear on here? No, of course, man. Okay, good. No rules on this <laughs> podcast. If people don't want to consume the content, that's their choice. Right. You, be who you are is right. more important than anything else. Okay, cool. So, um, 
And, you know, my brother, uh, Colin, he was closest to me uh, in age. You know, my oldest brother, Devin, was eight years older. Colin was three and a half, four years older. So all of his friends were all, you know, unfortunately, most of them are, uh, he's like the only one that made it out, um, all of which are in prison or dead from overdoses. Um, but at the time, um, you know, they were all, you know, getting high and, you know, they also had started getting into like some more hardcore drugs like cocaine, some of which heroin, even at the early age of 14, 15 for them. So mind you, I, you know, started boxing when I was, uh, 10 years old and that kind of saved me from the progression. It didn't save me from doing these things, but it saved me from it progressing so fast. Uh, cause I was obsessed with boxing by the time I was 12. Um, I can name every heavyweight champion in chronological order from the time they started wearing boxing gloves. So back to John L Sullivan. And, um, you know, I was, uh, I was just obsessed, man. I, I would go to the gym five, six days a week. I was a gym rat. You know, I had an amateur record of 32 and one. Um, I quit when I was 15. And, you know, by the time I was 15, I had already tried cocaine. Um, I was still smoking weed every day. I was in high school now. So um, things were getting uh, a little bit, um, they were progressing more, I, I should say. And, um, you know, I, I basically quit boxing because I, be, I, I started to become so good that um, they wanted me to train all the time uh, right after school. And uh, I was scheduled to go to the Junior Olympics in Colorado Springs in 2005. And uh, that was just something that, you know, it was taking away too much time from my after school activities, like smoking weed, chasing girls, you know, getting high, that kind of stuff. Um, excuse me. So, <clears throat> just to speed it up a little bit, I, um, when I was 16, I started getting in legal trouble. Uh, at this point, my parents obviously knew that there was some serious problems going on. You know, I was running away from home. I got caught sneaking out like every other night. You know, we used to do this thing back in um, freshman year where I would, we would all sneak out of our parents' houses and, and meet at, um, you know, the designated hangout house where the parents didn't care what the kids did. Um, so we would all meet there. And uh, if, you know, the cops ch would, would catch us, because um, I don't know if it's still a rule, but if you're under 17, you can't be out past a certain time. So we were all obviously under, you know, we looked, uh, there was only one of us that w looked old enough, but, um, you know, if the cops found us, they would chase us. So we would literally try to, try to be seen by the police so we could run. And the object was to get back to the friend's house. You know, in a worst case scenario, the cops would catch us and take us back home. So, you know, that was just the kind of stuff that we did. Um, when I was 15, I had first tried crack cocaine. Um, by the time I was 16, you know, I, I had some uh, legal charges. I got caught um, stealing from like six or seven different properties. Uh, well, I had articles from six or seven different properties and I, I was on a cocaine binge overnight um, and it was from three different cities. And, um, you know, the police caught me early in the morning and I, got, I blew, I blew numbers. So I got an MIP. They didn't catch me with any, um, narcotics, but you know, that was my first charge. I got an MIP. So I was on probation, which made, um, uh, getting high and getting away with it extremely difficult. So I was, uh, an outpatient on probation. Um, and that was like the beginning of the downward, my first real bad downward, downward spiral, um, and then I started, you know, experimenting with heroin. You know, I lost my first really close friend to a heroin overdose. His name was Blaine Brabant. And this kid was, uh, just to give you an image of what this kid looked like, he was my brother's friend, so he was older. He was a short, shorter, stocky dude. He's probably about 5'9", 250 pounds, uh, quarter black, quarter white, half Native American. And this kid grew up in foster homes, and he was a mean... He was a mean motherfucker, and uh, I looked up to him so much because everyone was afraid of him. You know, everybody in, in, in the city of Royal Oak at the time was afraid of him. And um, 
I really looked up to him and I, I looked at him as like almost invincible. You know, he was like the leader of my brother's crew. And, um, you know, he, he called me the night that he, I think it was a suicide uh, overdose. He called me the night, he called my house looking for my brother the night that he did that. And around that time, he had, he had been calling my brother all the time. My brother was starting to distance himself from all of his friends. So um, he called us that night, and, uh, you know, he had, like, a different tone in his voice. And um, he just, you know, I, he said, is Colin there? I said, no. What's up? Um, and he was like, just tell him that I called, okay? And he was like, all right, man. And he's like, all right, I'll talk to you later. And he's being, like, nice to me. So I, I kind of thought that as strange. And then we found out the next day that he had... Uh, he had not made it through the night. He was found the next morning, um, died from a heroin overdose. So, you know, that was my first experience uh, losing a friend, which actually, unfortunately, becomes a big part of my story. Um, but I remember the next day, the reason I bring that whole story up was because I remember the next day I, would, I vowed to myself I would never do heroin. I would do everything else but heroin. And, um, you know, with, sure enough, within six months, in the low opinion I had of myself, um, I started experimenting with heroin because everything else became boring. Um, like I said, even back to when I was a child, everything was all about being excited, exhilarated, you know, getting into the next bad thing, you know, whatever can give me that rush, you know, and that um, came up. It was heroin. And around 2006, the fentanyl epidemic had started really bad in the Midwest and specifically Detroit. A lot of kids started dying. 19 kids alone from my city in the month of January of 2006 died. And, and Royal Oak's a small city, you know. Um, not small, but 19, 19 kids in one month is, is quite, a, quite a few people. Um, so I, I started doing heroin uh, when I was 16. That carried on for about a year. And then, you know, I got sent to, I had an intervention done on me. I'd gotten sent to a rehab facility, uh, violated probation, so I was looking at jail time. Um, but at the time, it was juvenile time. I didn't. I, I don't think I would have been tried as, tried as an adult because I was still 17, and I committed the crime when I was 16. So <clears throat> this was the first honest desire that I had to get help. It was the first time in my life where I realized that I really had a problem. So I remember I got home from a long walk one day. You know, I'd been walk. You know, growing up, I walked everywhere. You know, uh, I grew up at 10 Mile in Woodward. Detroit uh, was two miles away, so I would walk down to the dope spot all the time. Um, in a terrible neighborhood, you know, being white and very young looking was not an advantage, I guess I could say, in that in that uh, kind of environment. So um, you know, I had guns guns pulled on me, put in my face, been jumped. Um, knocked unconscious, got thrown off my bike when I was 15, had to get eight staples in the side of my head. Um, so, you know, I, I reached out to my mom for help. And, uh, you know, I went back to that same treatment center, but this time it was different. This time I really wanted to do it. And I had already been going to AA meetings as a requirement of my, my probation. And, um, you know, these people in those rooms, they had something that, you know, at first I thought they were all full of shit. I thought they were all high. They're all lying. You know, why are they so happy? You know, why there's a just certain camaraderie about them that I, I envied and I wanted. Um, so, you know, I petitioned. And the, the treatment center that I went to was called Keros. It was up in Saginaw. It was like a juvenile slash treatment center. It was a placement for people with drug, drug charges, um, or for kids with drug charges, you know, uh, under 17. So I went back there, but I had a, a real desire, and they knew me there. So, you know, I remember I had a um, two therapists designated to our pod. There were three pods, pods A, B, and C. And uh, my therapist, Don McLaughlin and Linda, they, they helped change my life. They were both members of recovery, and they could see that I was serious about it this time. And I had all these grand plans when I got out of what I was going to do to change. And um, and I, I didn't mention I got kicked out of high school, and I got my GED when I was in there. Um, but, you know, the day that I got out, I went to my sentencing hearing, and I had, like, four um, 
violations on my probation. And I look, I still thought I was going to be doing some jail time, but the judge decided to give me one more chance, and they sent me to a place called Dawn Farms in Ann Arbor. And uh, so I'd literally been free for a day, and I got sent back to another placement. You know, but this place, this place was for adults. Um, there was a lot more freedoms there. Obviously, it was inpatient treatment, but like, for example, the group, there was like a group of 20 of us in there and we were allowed to get ride outs, like uh, get numbers from people in the AA community or the recovery community in Ann Arbor and have them pick us up for meetings, take us out. You know, we'd be able to go on group walks and it's like right in downtown Ann Arbor. So I was like totally intrigued by that city. I, I fell in love with that city. So I, I completed that treatment and I got out and, um, you know, I, I didn't go back home. You know, I think that's the biggest turning point in my life was when I didn't go back home. I stayed there. And uh, being 17 in a new city on my own, you know, within six months, I had uh, I became a manager at a restaurant. I obtained a GED a year early. My, my graduating class was supposed to graduate that, that, coming, um, that coming summer, but that was the, the, the previous fall. So I felt really good about that. And I got all my charges expunged because, uh, well, all but one expunged. But um, because at the time they had something called HIDA. I think they still have it. But I met all the probationary requirements. And the judge even called me up to the stand and shook his hand. And I remember just feeling so proud of myself. It was the first time in my life that I felt that proud of myself, other than when I would win a boxing match. Um, and that has a huge that has a huge role in any addict or alcoholic's life, or any normal people, but specifically addicts and alcoholics, mostly because uh, a lot of them are just driven by this just self hatred that they have based on you know what they've done and the people that they love because of the disease that they're suffering from. So you know that's why I bring that up. Um, now I can't I, you know I'll spare you the details, but. I'll say this, I've, uh, in the last 12 years, I've been sober 11 of them. Um, I have not been sober. That was the year 2007 that I went to Dawn Farm. I have not stayed completely sober um, continuously since then. I've had a few really bad relapses, and I've had um, a few overdoses. Um, so, one second. So just to make the long story short, <clears throat> Um, I had my first overdose, actually like a month before I moved in with you, we talked about it. Um, I, uh, I went through a really bad breakup and, um, like my heart was broken and it was with a girl in AA. So like my sacred place that I would go to, um, I would have to see her and not only her, I would have to see the girl, the guy that she was now dating and, you know, um, my my ego gets out of control if I don't put it in check, and that was something that was very uh, traumatic for my ego. Um, I can laugh at it now, but it, it made AA a very unsacred place for me. You know, this place that I had um, had built up, you know, and, and I've, I've I had built up such an esteemable reputation in that community, uh, part you know, for the young people in recovery. Um, I just felt destroyed. So, like, I'm not blaming it on that. I'm blaming it on, you know, my lack of uh, care for my care for my spiritual fitness. But um, that did not make it easy. Um, so I, like, ended up, you know, I, I had a masonry company that I had started, and it was flourishing, and I had a lot of money saved up. So I took my brand-new truck, and I, I went across country with this grand design that I was going to get sober and live my life in, um, in California. Um, and in, in, in that 12 years that I had mentioned, you know, I had a daughter in 2010 and um, I was engaged and I had a fully brand new furnished apartment and I was working as I was actually the youngest social worker in Washtenaw County history. I was working at the homeless shelter and it was one of the most prideful and um, fulfilling jobs that I've ever had, being able to help people and get paid for it, being able to love what you do for, you know, for a living and, um, you know, so like fast forward to 2016, you know, I, I had had that overdose, um, you know, and, and I had thought that I would never overdose. I just thought I was like too good of a heroin addict or some stupid shit like that. So 
I, uh, I didn't know what to do and my parents didn't know what to do. You know, they'd gone through this rodeo with me time and time again. It's kind of uh, discouraging for, you know, you to do so well for three and a half years, but still fall even deeper into that pit um, or that realm of just complete and utter hopelessness. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had three years a couple times. I've had two years sober, you know, um, so like, you know, I had that overdose and I moved in with you, you know, I had met you the following, um, or the previous, uh, year. And I was helping one of Russ Dobbs and I was helping him get ready for a training camp. And, um, you know, cause he knew I used to be a boxer and, um, you know, I got, I, I think I trained here two or three times and, uh, Chris Vish gave me a call because he saw me training with Russ and, you know, I was, sorry, Russ, if you're listening, but I was beating Russ's ass standing up and he took me to the ground with like no problem and mounted me. And I just felt like a little baby. And I was like, I need to learn how to do this because I'm not, I'd be damned if I let these fucking wrestlers beat my ass because I don't know how to do any groundwork. Um, so that's what that was what initially relit that fire that had been d- extinguished for ten years. So I started coming back here. Um, I, well, I started coming here, and I uh, I had only been here three times. And I got a phone call from Chris Vish on a Thursday, asking me if I wanted to fight the following Saturday, th- in three days. And I was like, "Fuck, man!" And uh, he's like, "You know what? I th- I think it'll just destroy this kid." Which I would have, you know, if it was anybody else, but the guy that I fought. Um, so yeah, I was like, fine. Yeah. I flipped the coin on it. I said, let me call you back. I flipped the coin on it. Coin landed on heads. I said, uh, tails, I don't fight heads. I fight. So, you know, I I stayed true to my, my coin toss and I, uh, I fought and, you know, in the fight, I, I was beating the kids and mind you, I was out of shape. I hadn't done shit for 10 years. You know, I had worked out, lift weights and whatever, but, um, I remember, like, you, like, everyone's like, who's this Taylor kid? You know, I, you know, like, why is he fighting? He's only been here three times. So uh, I, I took the fight, and, you know, I was – it was against Grant Cashman, who ended up becoming um, the XFC – or, no, the WXC, I'm sorry, the WXC uh, middleweight champion, amateur middleweight champion the following year. But he was a, he was a decent grappler, and uh, he, was, he was strong, and he could take a punch. But I dropped him in the first round. I was beating the shit out of him. Got him in a deep guillotine, but I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to finish it. His face was turning purple, but he still wouldn't tap. And he got me to the ground. And I completely gassed out. And they got me in a mounted crucifix. And he was just hitting me in the head until the ref stopped the fight. Like, I wouldn't go out. I remember I was having a conversation with the ref. It was, uh, it was Don. Um, and then, you know, after that, the next day, you had the the photo the the team photo here, and uh, I showed up and I, you know everyone was like, "What's up, man? Great fight!" You know, blah blah blah. And I just I received a lot of respect, and like I felt like I was a part of you know camaraderie has always been a huge attraction for me. Like I had spoke of before, you know, and the camaraderie that was here at SFS, I wanted to be a part of it. And not only did I want to be a part of it, I wanted to fight again. And uh, it relit that fire for me. And you relit that inspiration, that passion for me. So, you know, fast forward to, you know, when I had fallen short. Or uh, let me get this out of the way for my ego's sake. Six weeks later, I won my first MMA fight by fucking submission. And you told me not to, not to try to submit him, but I still got his ass. And probably the best triangle choke I've ever thrown. So, uh you know, um, that was that was awesome. And that was actually the night that me and Mike started really talking. Um, I remember we were backstage cracking up because I didn't know how to tie a tie and he tied my tie for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, I, you know, fast forward to when I moved in with you, I was in a really bad spot and me and you had gotten pretty close and uh, you let me move into your basement. And, you know, my plan at the time was just to focus all my energy on going pro at boxing. And um, that's what I did. So I moved in with you, and I made my professional debut um, November 16, 2016, and won my first round knockout. And then I quickly had my second fight against a tough ass dude in his hometown of Columbus, Ohio. The f- six days later, and um, you know I had <clears throat> I was not sober. 
um, during the time of my training camp, but I wasn't doing any hard stuff. I was just drinking, I met a new girl. I was drinking a lot, smoking weed. So after my first fight, I went hard for a couple of days. And I took this, you know, I took this kid lightly because he was just, just an MMA fighter in quotation. Um, and uh, it was a tough fight. You know, this kid hit me with a left, left hand, like in the first round. I couldn't hear anything until the second round. And uh, it ended up being a draw. But I got a draw in his hometown, which, which says a lot. I had the kid drunk almost almost on the ground for like the entire fourth round of the fight. It was super exciting. Everyone loved it. But um <clears throat> yeah, man, it it was uh it was a dream come true to be pro. I remember sitting down and crying uh because I was so happy after I went when I after my first fight cuz that was a nasty knockout, you know, and it, it went about as good as a pro debut could go to be honest with you. Um and you know, in the last since I went pro, um, I had a few relapses. <clears throat> and uh, where do you, know, where do you stand at the as of this day and time? As of this day and time, I stand very sober. <laughs> and what about as a boxer? Oh, as a boxer, um, what's your record now? I'm ten Titles? and zero. I'm ten and zero with two knockouts. I'm ranked number thirteen in the world on the NABF, which is a big title. I'm the NABF junior light heavyweight champion, and I'm the Michigan state champion. Um, so, yeah. That's where I wanted to get to because yeah. this, the beginning Sorry, of this I story, so long. no, it's actually, it's excellent. The beginning of this story starts to paint one, you know, spectrum of life, one side of this experience, one part of the roller coaster. Right. But now you're sitting on the opposite end of the spectrum, which is what we're about to get into now today with Mike is, you know, you've faced pretty much every adversity that could be thrown your way from where you grew up to the things that were in your life to, you know, heartache and loss of people that are very close to you to disappointment, to failures. You easily could have given up all the way, gone to the wrong choices permanently, or just never tried to find out what you were made of, but something within you still had that spark that you got back in the ring. And now today, like you said, as a super successful professional boxer, somebody that I look up to for what you're doing, I mean, you're crushing it. Thank so you. now let's get to the point. Um, you and Mike are working on a huge project together. Yeah. I'm going to have Mike lead into this part. Uh, basically, you know, tell us what you're working on guys. Uh, well, as you just heard, Taylor's story is pretty fantastic. And after my last film, which is a sports <clears throat> film, I had some good contacts in the sports cinematic world and they said do you have any other stories and uh it was pretty fun this this has kept me going for a long time because before i could even get the thought of asking myself out taylor doer's name popped in my head and although we you know knew each other from here and respected each other we weren't like hanging out or anything like right. that so it was not a name that was at the forefront of my brain ever and called him up and said i got some ideas about making a film about you he said cool sounds good you know we talked about it a little bit what uh, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead when I say this, but what what to me is one of the more fascinating parts of this is when we kind of laid out his trajectory as a professional boxer. We had marked, I mean, we had kind of thought right about now is where he would be getting to the title fights and everything like that. I don't know if it was as soon as we decided to make a film about him, whatever. But the universe just said and put every. I mean, shit just started happening. And so I'll let him tell it, but like he had a specific trajectory. And what he thought was a massive loss and like a disappointment in that trajectory turned out to be a huge advantage, which then led him to where we are now. So, yeah, I mean, it's an incredible story. He's very clearly very articulate. He makes a great protagonist. And then, you know, Detroit boxer, heroin, uh, all those things are, are key points in, in cinematic kind of culture. So, so it was an easy fit. Yeah, it's the ingredients of you know, to then make the recipe for the ultimate story, extreme adversity, some type of, of struggle with either inner demons or external things, you know, and then the idea that you can still rise from these things. Everybody appreciates success because we all desire su success to some level, but more than just success, people that can overcome extreme adversity and show resilience is one of the most admired you know, traits in this culture. People love resilience. People love people that battle back. Josh Parisian being a good example. People love resilience. So as of this point in time, you're now sitting here as a super successful professional boxer on the verge of blowing up to the mega stage with a gentleman that believes in you uh, fully in your story and in your message and in the power of, of 
when you convey it, convey this to the right people, it can change lives. And I, you know, 100% support that story and believe in that as well. This is an incredibly powerful moment in your life. So let's talk a little bit about what does the next three to six months look like? What, you know, in the competitive career, in when we're launching this project and uh, just li- anything like start as of this point in time, let's build what's coming next down the pipe. All right. So just, just to touch real quick on when Mike, Mike had approached me, I believe, and it was like, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, God, what month was that? It was probably around like November of 2018. 18. Yeah. He approached me about making the film and um, that was like really when I started getting with the real specialists. Like you use the word specialist when you asked me to come and spar Cody. He needed help with with a specialist. Um, the reason why I left SFS was because this is an MMA gym, and I wanted to be with specialists and boxing specifically. And um, that was really right around the time that I started getting. I started going to this gym called World's Best in Detroit, and it's some of the best fighters in Detroit that you'll see, um, or even in the world, that come in there, come in that gym. Um, and but the most intriguing thing about when Mike asked me to do it was, you know, what we're taught or told to do, and what I like doing anyways. Um, back to like me working at the homeless shelter, I like helping others. Um, if there is a platform in which I can get my my message out there. Because the twelfth step is carry the message to alcoholics just don't suffer. And if I could do that on a large scale and maybe help millions of people get a per- perspective, a different perspective on what sobriety looks like, what recovery looks like, then uh, fuck yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, now for the next three to six months, you're going to like this. I mean, maybe maybe you won't. I don't know. Um, I was supposed to fight. Uh, something just fell through. I've been training in, in uh, Florida for the last. Uh, two months. I went down there, there was a prospect, you know, these guys, these promoters wanted to sign me, some things didn't work out the way that I thought. Um, I was in probably the best shape of my life a couple weeks ago until I found out that the fight that I was supposed to fight would have been October 17th for the WBO international title, but that fell through, which was, you know, pretty devastating for me, so I kind of laid in my hotel room for about a week watching Peaky Blinders, but, um, things emerged you know things don't happen for a reason I've learned that and one thing I need to learn is to not get too caught up unless contracts are signed um but uh one thing that is promising a prospect for me you know I met this guy named Ulysses Diaz uh he's a cruiserweight boxer out of Miami he came down here um uh, about a year and a half ago when we were shooting the film um Mike wasn't there with the camera that day, but he, he needed some sparring. So, you know, he heard about me, he came down, we sparred. Um, I don't kiss and tell, but, you know, we, we uh, after which he had a massive amount of respect for me as a fighter. So uh, me and him have been friendly, you know, DMing, whatever. Uh, so I went down there and, and, and met up with him last Wednesday in Miami. We fed the homeless. You know, he was able to get this thing that's uh, hooked up through the Miami Dolphins to feed the homeless, where they provide 300 meals, and we just go and hand them out to these, you know, people living in tents on underpasses. And, uh, you know, it was a good turnout. About 30 people came out, and in which those 30 people was his management team. And these guys have been put in charge of organizing and I think maybe matchmaking as well for the BKFC event that's coming up in Miami in November. So I'm thinking like, yo, bare knuckle boxing is just boxing with no gloves and I'm Irish. So it fits. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, I reached out to them cause I need, I haven't fought since last November. So I, I, you know, and things have fallen through because of COVID. I was supposed to fight in Russia in April. That fell through. I had another you know, maybe fight, you know, over the summer that fell through. So I just want to fight. Um, so, so it's definitely been a tough year for you. Yeah. And how have you been handling your mind in this moment? Because you've basically, while telling your story said that really during the tough emotional times is when you find yourself struggling, but 
the gentleman that sits here in front of me today, you seem like you have your things, your head on very well. You have, you exude a good energy. Mm. What has 2020 been like and how are you staying focused? Because you may have tapped into a part of the secret for that success in the future. It's been rough, man. Um, you know, I'll just be open and honest. Uh, so I, uh, some, some, some really big uh, fell through at the beginning of the year right away. I got a short notice fight offer uh, to be on Showtime main event against the dude that I knew I could beat because he had trained in my gym, a Russian kid. And um, it was a two week short notice and I was kind of out of shape, but whatever, it was 50,000. So we wanted the fight, so we said, fuck yeah. Um, and then through, and I'm not gonna say any names, but I used to have a promoter that didn't meet his uh, requirements in the contract, but he's still under the impression that he promotes me. So he found out that I got this fight offer, called the promoter, threatened to sue if he didn't get his percentage, and then my name was taken off the slot, even though I had already got a contract sent to me and I had sent it back signed. So that devastated me. And I'm not using that as an excuse, but I was, I get, you know, I get, like with a fighter, especially like me, I visualize, I start to manifest. Once I get the information in my head, I start to manifest. One thing I've always been able to do, not always, but often have been able to do, is really manifest my reality. And what I say, uh, what I mean by that is like, I'll say, I usually use this example in meetings, is like no matter where I was or what circumstance I was under, if I needed to get high, I would manifest that into a reality. I would be high within a couple hours. And why not, why not channel that into something good? Right, um, and most most drug addicts can't argue with that. They'll be like, yeah, me too, <laughs> you know. So like, if I can't, you know, I've always been able to manifest, and in doing so, I start to visualize. I start to really get get my heart into it. And when something gets ripped out of my hands over something like that, I was just devastated. So I let I let uh, that demon inside me get the worst of me, um, or that bad wolf, uh, so to speak, and I ended up relapsing uh for four days and in this relapse this was january 14th of this year and in this relapse i um i overdosed in front of my parents and this is the uh second time my mom has seen me like that um and it's it's uh it's sh it's shattering it really is my dad saw me it was the first time my dad ever saw me like that um yeah, and I, my dad was on the way back home with me, obviously frustrated. And uh, he's like, what are you trying to say by doing this? He doesn't really understand. Um, I don't even really understand how my brain works. I'm not a asking him to, for it to be understood or accepted because it's completely, you know, I'm dying in front of them. There's no excuse for that. And there's no way to make that sound okay. So um, this is what I said to him. I said, what do you mean? I can't, and obviously their emotions were high. Um, I said, what do you mean? I'm not trying to say anything. You know, you can come home and have a couple drinks, just take the edge off or to relieve your pain. I die, you know, like I can't just have a couple drinks. You know, I have a couple drinks. I want to get some crack. I smoke some crack. I'm, I'm really high up, so I need to come down. You know, when I come down, I buy this, you know, and what I bought that day, um, in Detroit, it's like a drive through You just go to a neighborhood and you, they'll whistle at you. If you get whistled at in a specific neighborhood, you know, just tell them what you need, yada, yada, yada. You get what you, you don't even need your phone numbers. You need to know who the people are. But the unfortunate thing about that is you don't know what you're getting. So I, um, I bought about $10 worth and I did about $2 worth of that. And I only snorted it. And, um, Literally, if I were to show you what $2 looked like on the table, you'd be like, how is this happening? How is this poison being put on the streets? And it's fentanyl that's so strong because the problem is, is that these chemists that are hired by whatever cartel, um, they make it. They're high, you know, really good chemists that they make fentanyl, pure fentanyl, and then it gets mixed in with other powder right, to stretch it out and make it less, less potent so it won't kill people, right? But you can't if you're not in a uh, if you're not in a lab, you're not distributing that properly. You know, you could have one batch that has, you know, um, 80 percent pure fentanyl, 20 percent cut 
And that's pretty much what I got. So I literally snorted maybe like 10 grains of this stuff. And it killed me even after having a four-day habit. So my tolerance was pretty high already. But I had got a new batch. And uh, 10 grains of it killed me within 15 minutes right in front of my parents. And, um, you know, that's the sad thing about this is it's, you know, uh, I could go into a whole, whole thing about regulation and decriminalizing and having, you know, hubs for, you know, real heroin and, you know, distributing it kind of like, you know, countries like uh, the Netherlands or, you know, Portugal or even parts of Canada do. Um, but I won't go into that. Um, so that was this year. Since then, um, I have had a lot of momentum. Um, and it's got, you know, struck down a few times, but I've been able to keep a, a cause you know, after going through something that traumatizing, um, and do, you know, I definitely have PTSD, not just from that, but from everything, mostly from the 38 people that I've lost in my life. But, you know, it just goes to show like, no matter how bad I know it is for me, there's some part of my brain, some part of me, my spirit that feels it just goes back if I'm not, you know, I love the idea of spiritual conditioning, spiritual fitness. I'm not, and it's exactly like that. Um, if, if I don't, if I don't do, you know, I can't stay strong on the push-ups that I did last week. You know what I'm saying? You know, I can't stay sharp on my, my jujitsu if I, if, you know, if I'm resting on my laurels from the classes that I took a couple months ago, you know, regardless of how much I learned, you know, so regardless of how much I know about recovery, I could recite the big book of AA back and forth, regardless of how much I know about my own story, if I'm not spiritually fit, I'm not going to be able to perform, right? Just like in, in MMA or boxing, if I'm not physically fit, I'm not going to be able to perform. And in, in an analogy for that, the opponent that I'm going up against is a world champion, right? Um, right now, as I'm talking, my disease is doing push-ups in the corner, you know what I'm saying? So, for normal people to understand, I usually try to use this analogy. Uh, like, why don't you just stop? I can stop. All right, well, try to think about this. Try to think about not being able to have sex with your wife when you, you know, lay in bed with her every night. She's gorgeous and she's naked and she wants to have sex with you and keeps talking things in your ear, but you can't. You just can't. That's the only way that I can really... <laughs> put it on a platform for it to be kind of understandable. Um, when I'm in a, when I'm in the wrong place and I'm not taking care of myself spiritually more than physically and mentally, I'm in trouble, man. And, and if I get presented with a, with a, uh, a stressful situation, you know, it's, it's hard to deal with. Wow. The, um, the way that you just presented that and uh, it, it triggered something in my brain, you're basically forced because of your background and your story up to this point to be a fighter every moment of your life. Because when you're not in the ring fighting, you're training. And if you're not physically training, you have to be mentally training. Right. If you're not being a fighter every moment of your life, your life could come to an end. So you are basically blessed or cursed to the fact that you're meant to be a fighter, dude. It's you're both, yeah. You're meant oh, to. Yeah. The, the last line of the film, I'm not going to give it away, but we bring the whole film to exactly that sentiment that you just touched on. I mean, it's 100% true for every moment of this man's waking life until the end. Now you are forced to be a fighter, but you know what? Make that a blessing. You are a fighter. You've been a fighter since I met you, since you walked in the door the first time. And I went, yeah, that guy's got it right. People, you exude it. You are a fighter. You just have to embrace that to the core that every moment, moment of my life is going to be a fight, but I am a fighter. Right, so I want to go a little bit further into the film now because I'm like I'm incredibly excited. But I watched the trailer and it gave me like chills down my spine, like the uh, the movie The Fighter about Mickey Ward, or if you went to like a cultural icon, although it's fictional, the Rocky story. Mm -hmm. These movies deeply influence people. People appreciate the like iconic hero that's created, whether fictional through Rocky or like you know the Fighter with Mickey Ward was absolutely incredible you are a version of that story, you know, and you have equally struggled with as much as what you witnessed in the fighter. All, Cause it wasn't on Mickey Ward. It was his brother that was yeah. always battling. You're fighting the battle every moment, both in the ring and out of the ring. So as a, 
you know, someone that captures stories as a profession, when you first sat down with Taylor and you recognized the depth of this story, because that's really the, the pull to it, why it's so attractive to want to watch this story, because most people can't understand what the man has gone, gone through, but we're, we're oftentimes pulled by our curiosity. You know what I mean? When you hear his story, even the beginning of this podcast, what this gentleman has endured to be sitting here today and still be chasing his dream and still be on the path of, you know what? If you knock me down, I will get up. He's just a fighter on the inside. What was that like for you? When did the film really start to come together? And where are we at in this moment? Talk us through kind of the the building process. So you had the vision. Taylor Dewar came into your mind. You guys start shooting. Bring us to this point. Um, that's kind of, yeah. There's a lot to that, but I will be. Specific. As much as you'd no, like. No, I'll be, I'll be specific on the points that I think are key. So any story has a, pro, a lead protagonist um, that has an emotional need and a physical want. And then the journey to the end, at least in Western culture storytelling, is a three-act structure to get them to the end. You introduce their want, you introduce the conflict, you introduce the opportunity to go into the journey. Um, then once they're in the journey, they have to fall down into the pits of hell. From there, they rise up like the phoenix with a new skill, and then they approach their final demon, which they either win or don't, either defeat or don't defeat. That's basically a three-act structure of, you know, Joseph Campbell wrote it, Aristotle wrote it. That's the way every movie you ever watch is going to play out. So Taylor's story fits into that beautifully. I've been doing this long enough to know to know the, the, the archetypes of the story. So we've got a man with a very specific physical want, a title, and an emotional need to no longer be dependent on drugs. And you've got Detroit gyms, and the city of Detroit is the background to let it all play out. And he looks pretty good with his shirt off and six foot two and a good looking dude. Five. Yeah, he's not 6'2". Six two. Six I'm 6'2". Six he's 6'5". He towers over me. It's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't spend a lot of time around people taller than me. Um, <laughs> So that was it. And now what emotionally engages me into a story is if I have a natural propensity and a, uh, and a curiosity about it. So my curiosity is I've never, I've, I've smoked for way too long, but I quit when I quit because I don't want to do it anymore. I probably have a coffee addiction now, but if I told me I had to quit, I could do it. So I'm looking at this dude who I know is incredibly intelligent, who I know loves his family, loves his life, tough as fuck. So why can't he quit this thing? And why can't anybody else? That's me, for me, the hook that gets me in. Because if I'm not particularly, it's a great story, but I'm not particularly interested, then there's no reason to spend two years of my life doing it. Um, That was the part for me. And so when we first started, that was the agreement. Not the agreement, the understanding. He really wanted to get his story out for people who were addicted. I really wanted to tell the story for people who, like me, didn't understand what makes an addict an addict. And so that was the, the real hook between us. Is the, and then the story just played itself out, you know, in an unbelievable way. I, I, I don't want to give the story away, but it's, it could not have played itself out more beautifully, and I could not have been more honored or grateful to be there to capture it. And we're at the point now where the film is in a rough cut basis. Like, it's basically complete. We're not talking that this is going to come out in a year. I mean, we're at the point where you're very close to bringing this story to life. Yeah, I mean, the coronavirus is a bit of a kick in the balls to the whole thing. So we finished our rough cut April 4th. Um, yeah, the, the parts I can tell. So corona, it, premier, it, we finished the rough cut April 4th, um, which was the deadline we wanted to, and my goal was to have the film sold by June. Unfortunately, April 4th was a month into the pandemic and everything shut down and nobody was doing anything. Um, but it did have its benefits. Um, Peter Berg famous filmmaker, came on board, saw the film. We share the same composer, and actually one of the guys that I work with a lot uh, works for his company. So I don't know who showed him his film, and I happen to be working for another project for his company, so I was working with his ex-wife a lot. So somehow he got the film. He's a huge boxing fan. He called me up. He said, it's the best boxing movie I've ever seen. Had really nice things to say about Taylor. Said, I want to come on you know, and help you get this movie sold. So we've been working with Film 45, his company, um, taking it around to all the major outlets, Got an incredible feedback. Um, some passed because it wasn't what they were doing anymore. They weren't doing sports. Some made offers that we appreciated but didn't really fit what we needed. And then we're working with one specific company now that seems pretty gung-ho on it and wants to do the things. Because not only do we want the film, I won't say any names, but let's say you put it on a streaming service, comes in and buys it. There's so much fucking content now that it could easily live in their home base and nobody ever see it because if they're not promoting it. So we want to work with a company that was not only going to 
be a good outlet for the film, but that believed in it was going to pump it. That was kind of key because the social impact of this film is far more important than anything else. We all want to make money off of it. We all have to make money off of it. That's how we pay our bills. But the social impact is the key piece, and not to mention what it could do for Taylor's career. So, so this company that we're talking with now, you know, it's it's unfortunately been a little bit longer in the conversation than we wanted. They feel the same way, but with coronavirus, everything's getting restructured. Everybody's having to figure out how they're moving forward, changing strategies. So we've had to be incredibly patient, which is part of, you know, I don't know which one requires more patience, the boxing world or the film world, but that's the, that's the burden that we're carrying right now. But it's in a great place. Um, we're having a, a, you know, we're very excited about the possibilities of it. I have no idea when they would actually release it. Once they say go, like we left it at rough cut because we want them to have the opportunity to put the, their input in. They might say, you know, try this, do this, whatever. Um, so that's why you only get it to rough cut. You don't f- actually finish the film. So, um, you know, we've, we've been, the, the talks have been heating up um, right now. Hopefully by the end of this month, we'll have everything signed and papered. But I had hoped that by last month too. So um, when they release it, will be up to them. It will probably take, once they say green light go, I think it would take us probably six to eight weeks to get it you know exported and complete um so it could be ready by the end of this year but it'll probably be an early 2020 release so the last thing i want to ask you before i uh, have a final question for taylor is you were incredibly involved around the sport of boxing i mean it, it must have consumed a large amount of your time and now you're a mixed martial artist you train stand-up you train jiu-jitsu you've been around the boxing world forever boxing had its golden days earlier on but now all of a sudden it seems like boxing is starting to make a little bit of a resurgence and you were around the sport very, very intimately for a period of time. Talk a little bit about the sport of boxing and how it kind of ties in with the ideas of life because life is struggle. Life is having to step up to the plate. What did you learn during this process? Life is struggle and martial arts are great lessons for life. Boxing is a different. Boxing is, it's different. Like I, yes, I've, I've trained martial arts. I've, Definitely got punched in the face a lot, spent enough time in the cage. I know how to fight. I enjoy fighting. Boxing is not something that you are either a boxer or you are not. And I watch these guys. I watch them spar. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the gym with them. It is just a – It's a, honestly, there's one part of it that nobody gets is the monotony of it. I mean, they go in and do the same fucking workout every single day. You know, you jump rope, you hit the bag, you – punch something then you maybe spar maybe you don't but it's like dude don't you make you know here we come in we do jujitsu you do wall work you do you know let's get in this position and work our way out of there they just do the same shit over and over and over and over and over and over again which they have to do because it has to be that specific but then when you watch them spar and you watch the ballet of it and there is no like here sometimes you know you like, take it down to 70 percent. okay let's just flow roll let's work. boxing once you get in that ring it is we're fighting we're boxing go and the smallest movements, the smallest details, the smallest, like, roll my shoulder. I'm going to make sure my weight's here. I'm going to make sure my foot's here. I'm going to faint this way. The amount of detail necessary to be a successful boxer combined with the amount of just fucking grit and toughness, as well as I'm going to beat your ass, that there is an explosion in that and rare human beings where you get those elements that uh, I have not, and I feel pretty comfortable saying this, that is not, as demanding in any other martial art as it is in boxing. I have tremendous respect for it. And one of the things that I loved, one of my favorite parts of it, was to be around some of the world-class coaches that Taylor works with and hear them talking about it and hear them coaching him. I mean, he's an incredible encyclopedia of knowledge of boxing, both as a boxer and just the history of boxing. But then these other guys, these coaches who are like more my age that we're talking about, just do this, do this, this the way you do it. It's a, it is incredibly beautiful, and yet you got to be fucking nuts to do it. That was awesome. If that doesn't sell you on either a void or dive into boxing, <laughs> nothing will. Um, you know, because you, you're absolutely right. I mean, we were talking before the podcast. The, there's a limited ability to what you can do in a boxing ring. So you have to basically master things to such an incredible level to rise above your, your competitors. And there's just no other options. If you cannot find a way to victory with the things that are laid out, you have no other options. You can't take the person down. You can't start playing a different style. I can't, you know, in a mixed martial arts fight, if my hands aren't working, I'm going to try my kicks. If those aren't working, I might clinch. If that's not working, I'll try to put them on the wall. If that doesn't work, I got to take them down. In boxing, you have such a simple, but yet like elegant sport that is so grueling that you have to smash your opponent's head, body, and spirit until the end of the fight or until they quit. 
you know? hundred percent. It's incredible. So, uh, Taylor, the last thing in the way we're going to wrap this podcast up is because you talked a lot about manifesting and creating realities and, and visualizing, I'm massive on that. But mm-hmm. back when I was in a basement, I was saying, one day I'm going to own this mega facility and UFC fighters are going to travel here. And people were like, you're nuts, James, but good luck. Let's manifest together. What does the next three months, six months, one year look like from now? The film gets received. What does your life look like six months from now, a year from now? And both in the competitive world and the world of helping people through your film, through social work, through things like this? Oh, so what I see right now um, is I'm going to destroy somebody on November 13th in Florida in a bare knuckle boxing match uh, on pay-per-view. Um, then after that, my brand will blow up a little bit um, and I'm going to get connected with top rank or golden boy. Um, either top rank, golden boy, or matchroom boxing. I'm going to connect with one of those three, and I'm going to be on um, a fight either on ESPN, Showtime, or you know one of the streaming services. Uh, and that's within six months. Um, and after that, I'm going to win four fights after I sign a TV deal with whatever TV company slash promoter um, and I will be world champion by 2022. I love it. And after after I defend that belt one time, I'm out. I love it, man. Well, maybe. Uh, We'll see what the money's like. I'm I'm, I'm assuming the money's going to come in pretty heavy after that. And then really you get to start a new chapter. You get to be the man that truly built your story from the ground up despite all adversity, despite all odds, all inner demons, external problems, you made it. And that's what we should all strive for in this life. And then you'll get to have a beautiful new chapter where your family sees the man that you've become, the community sees the man you've become. And, you know, hopefully around the world, more people know the name Taylor Dewar. Oh yeah, man. I just want to say one more thing. Um, for anybody who's, uh, listening that struggles, um, I don't want any. I don't want this to be misrepresented. So yeah, I fight every day, every every moment. It's a fight, but not every fight has to be a struggle. You know, the more conditioned I am, the easier the fight is. You know, um, so with an, an an analogy, my disease is like a brawler, boxer, not a boxer. He's a brawler, and he wants to stand in the middle of the ring and go toe to toe and knock me out and kill me. What I have to do is I have to stay on the outside and pick that motherfucker apart, you know. Unfortunately, it'll never go away. It's ne- it's never been permanently eradicated um, by any medical means from, from which we know. Um, but the solution that I have found is tried and true, and uh, it's been tested and... Tested and tested, and that solution is the 12 steps of whatever uh, 12-step group that you uh, prefer. So if anybody is listening that is interested in maybe getting help, um, please reach out. You know, you can look up local meetings wherever you're at. Just go to a meeting. See, see, see if it's for you. If it's not for you, you know, keep trying it out. That's one thing I like about AA is they actually don't tell you to not drink. You know, I think... Hitting the bottom is is the most important part, you know, or, or understanding that you really have a problem is the most important part. So um, if it's for you, keep going. Just try it out. You know, what's what, what's the worst that could happen? You know, um, I honestly care, you know, and it uh, seems, unfortunately, that's a rarity these days to find people that actually give a fuck about other people. Um you know, I'm lucky to be sitting with two of those people right now, of which I know. So, um, thanks for having me on, man. Um, you know, you know, this is a dream come true. You know, I need to sit back and realize that when I'm complaining about the minor details of my, my life. You know, I have a beautiful daughter. You know, um, being a father is, is the first and most important thing in my life. Um, and I love her to death, you know, so... Um, yeah, thank you, man. Appreciate you. 
I'm going to hold you accountable to one final thing, man. Once this blows up, once you win your next world title, once you smash somebody on bare knuckle boxing, you're going to come back onto the podcast and you're going to tell me about your newfound perspective in life. And I hope you don't go down any McGregor roads because I, <laughs> I hear that success and crazy amounts of money can be difficult to handle. But you know what? You, you can sit with us again one day. It'll be the three of us. We'll all come in together and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just paint life from the newfound perspective and you'll be able to say, hey, I made it. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you for everybody that listened. Uh, and again, if you enjoy this content, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're definitely going to have Taylor Dewar back. Reach out to him directly if you need anything. Reach out to me. Reach out to Ramsdale. Man, we're just people, and uh, we're here to help. So thank you guys very much for tuning in. Thanks.